All right, everybody, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's dive in with a question. So go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you know the right answer. So the correct answer here is D, 45 to 55 years of age. So let's talk about menopause. First of all, one of the trickiest things that could confuse you in a vignette is thinking about menopause, but not knowing for sure if the patient is within the age range that you would strongly consider it. So the average age of onset is going to be right around 51 years of age, with most women reaching menopause between 45 and 55 years of age. But remember that if they're a tobacco smoker, it can actually lower that age. So that's really interesting to keep in mind. So if you've got someone who might be on the lower end or even just below that, but they have a history of smoking, you can use that as support for perhaps early onset. Okay, now, a very small percentage of women, right around 1%, may experience menopause before 40 years of age. If it happens between 41 and 45 years of age, we call this early menopause. And obviously, on a large scale, we know that the cause of menopause is what? It's the cessation of estrogen, uh, estrogen production from the ovaries. Now, let's not get into too many details about menopause here because for the step one exam, there's not a ton you need to know, but you should be aware that there are stages of menopause. Okay, There is the pre-menopause stage, this is before anything begins. During this phase um, or this stage, cycles are normal. Predicting one cycle is still easy and possible, assuming you could in the past. Um, early transition is the phase where there's a decrease in predictability about the period and about the cycle. Uh, it might vary from in length from month to month. Um, then we have the late transition, and this is characterized by two to 11 months with no menstrual period. And then we have our final stage, which is known as postmenopause. This is characterized by a lack of menstrual period for 12 consecutive months. Now, the term perimenopause is also used. This term is used to indicate the transition stages of menopause. Now, as estrogen levels drop, what's happening at the level of the hypothalamus and at the level of pituitary? Well, we get signals that there's not enough estrogen. So what's going to happen as a result? Well, the signals that would otherwise boost estrogen's production like GnRH, FSH, and LH, what are they going to do? Well, they're told there's not enough estrogen. They're going to go up. So one of the keys to confirming menopause is an elevation of these values. And we especially want to look at FSH levels. And as they increase higher and higher, on top of the common signs and symptoms of menopause, like hot flashes, uh, dryness, uh, sleep disturbances, atrophy of the vagina, etc., we can usually say this is sufficient to confirm the presence of perimenopause. Now, don't forget that estrogen is cardioprotective. And when it's no longer present, it means that your patient's at an increased risk of things like coronary artery disease and even osteoporosis. Now, one last thing I mentioned earlier during our discussion of the three types of estrogen was that there was one type of estrogen that dominates during menopause. Do you remember which one it was? It was estrone. And since we've got no functioning ovaries, do you know how this is going to get made? Well, it's via the peripheral conversion of androgens into estrone. Now remember, the androgens include testosterone, DHT, and androstenedione. Those will convert to estrone in the periphery. That's how we have a little bit of estrogen during menopause. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. Correct answer here is C. Let's talk about androgens, which of course includes testosterone, DHT, and androstenedione. Remember that testosterone comes from the testes. Now, androstenedione comes from the adrenals, and then DHT, I've talked about this a bunch already, is produced when testosterone is converted to DHT via which enzyme? You should know this, 5-alpha reductase. Now, quick side note, we can actually use a medication known as finasteride to block the conversion of testosterone to DHT. That's linked to male pattern baldness. Now, on top of this fact, don't forget that we can actually convert um, androgens in males to estrogen, which we don't want. How does this happen? Which enzyme causes the conversion of androgens to estrogen? That would be via the aromatase enzyme. Now, do you know which of the androgens is most potent? Well, if you said DHT, you're right. It goes DHT is greater than testosterone is greater than androstenedione. Now, let's look at DHT and then we'll look at testosterone. So DHT in early development, we talked about this earlier in a previous lecture, is needed for the normal differentiation of the penis, the prostate, and the scrotum. Now, later, it's going to be responsible for balding, obviously an unwanted side effect, 
And as I mentioned, we can slow or prevent this from happening. We use a drug known as finasteride. It's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Okay. Um, additionally, uh, what's going to happen later on is DHT can be responsible for growth of the prostate and increase sebaceous gland activity. Now, testosterone, we need this, of course, for a myriad of different functions in the body, including for the differentiation of the internal genital structures, like the vas deferens, the epididymis, and the seminal vesicles. Now, at the onset of puberty, it's going to be responsible for growth, growth of the penis, deepening of the voice, sperm development, increased muscle mass, as well as increased red blood cells. It also closes the epiphyseal plates, meaning of the end of the bones, and it's also responsible for libido. So low testosterone, hypogonadism, decreased libido. All right, let's move on to our next question. We've got a matching. We're gonna match the Tanner stage with this correct finding. So go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, there are your correct answers. If you need to jot this down, go ahead and pause because we're about to talk about Tanner stages. Keep in mind, Tanner stages aren't all encompassing. We look at three specific areas of development and we can assign a Tanner stage to each of the genitalia, the breast, and the pubic hair, right? So someone could be Tanner stage of one area and Tanner stage two or three or four or five of the other. First, we have Tanner stage one. This is characterized in males and females by complete lack of pubic hair, uh, as well as in females, a flat appearing chest with raised nipples. Think about Tanner stage one as your pre-puberty stage. This is basically what you're gonna find up until the onset of puberty and the onset of Tanner stage two. Now in Tanner stage two, both males and females start to develop pubic hair in small amounts. Males will start to experience testicular enlargement. Females will begin to develop breast buds and mound formation. Now this stage happens on average around eight to 11.5 years of age. Now, don't forget, females tend to enter puberty a little bit earlier than males. Now, breast bud development in females is the earliest detectable secondary sexual characteristic you should see in females. What is the earliest sign you'll see in males? Testicular enlargement. Now, Tanner stage three, which on average happens around 11 and a half to 13 years of age, is characterized by coarsening of the pubic hair in both males and females. Now, in males, you'll see an increase in penis size and length. In females, the breast will simply continue to enlarge. Now, Tanner stage four happens right around 13 to 15 years of age, and this is characterized by continued coarsening of the pubic hair, um, but the thighs yet are not affected. That's how you'll differentiate between four and five. In males, penis size will continue to increase, while females, the breasts continue to enlarge. As well, during Tanner stage four, in females, the, um, the areolas are still raised, and the breast mounds will, of course, uh, continue to develop. Now the final Tanner stage happens around 15 years of age, and it's characterized by coarse pubic hair in both males and females that crosses onto the medial aspect of the thighs. And as I mentioned, that's one of the ways you can de determine between Tanner stages four and five is in stage five, the pubic hair will begin to grow on the inner thighs as well. And like that's super important to help you to differentiate. Now, specifically in males, the testes and the penis will enlarge to their adult size during Tanner stage five, while in females, the breasts will take their final adult shape and the areola, which was previously um, raised, is now going to flatten. And that can also help you differentiate between Tanner stages four and five. Now, what do we call it if puberty starts too early? Meaning we start to see the development of secondary sexual characteristics before the age of eight years in girls and nine years in boys. Well, we would diagnose this with, uh, or we would diagnose this as a condition known as precocious puberty. And when it comes to precocious puberty, we've got either central or peripheral types. Now in central precocious puberty, we have an increase in secretion of GnRH. Now this can be caused by CNS tumors, but most often this is just gonna be simply caused by an early activation of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis, and the cause is unknown. It happens. The peripheral precocious puberty is completely independent of GnRH and is due to an increase in the production of sex hormones or exposure to exogenous sex hormones. Now, this can be linked to conditions like congenital adrenal hyperplasia, late egg cell tumors, estrogen secreting tumors, or conditions such as mccune albright syndrome. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer.
correct answer here is E. Let's look at the important details we need to know about Klinefelter syndrome. Of course, we know that this is a condition seen in males whereby they receive an extra X chromosome that results in them being 47XXY. Now this results from non-disjunction during meiosis one or meiosis two, where maternal and paternal meiotic non-disjunction each accounts for around 50% of cases. Now this is characterized by a few fairly consistent telltale signs. You're gonna have elevated levels of F FSH. Why does that happen? Well, patients with Klinefelter syndrome have dysgenesis of the seminiferous tubules. That lowers inhibin B, we talked about this earlier, that results in an elevation of FSH. They also have elevated levels of estrogen. That's because of Leydig cell dysfunction. When the Leydig cells are not working correctly, testosterone drops, that in turn increases LH, which in turn elevates estrogen levels. Now, physical findings are going to include uh, developmental delays, testicular atrophy, tall stature, increased length of long bones. That's a result of a delay in the closure of your epiphyseal plates. Uh, breast tissue development. That's, of course, in males known as gynecomastia. And they also have something unique, which is a female hair distribution. For example, a female hair pattern. Now, infertility is common in Klinefelter syndrome. And there's also an increased risk of a certain type of cancer in this condition. Now, without looking at your books, without cheating, do you know what type of cancer uh, is increased risk in Klinefelter syndrome? It's breast cancer. Now, the easiest way to remember this is, is that in Klinefelter syndrome, males develop breasts. They have gynecomastia. That's an easy way. They develop gynecomastia, increased risk of breast cancer. All right, let's move on to our next question. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is A. So Turner syndrome is a highly tested condition and it's going to be our most common cause of primary amenorrhea. So let's take a look at the important details we absolutely need to know to confidently go into our exam answering any Turner syndrome question. So first, remember that the female in this scenario is 45XO and the chromosomal loss here is often due to, to non-disjunction during meiosis or mitosis. And remember that meiosis errors are usually linked to paternal gametes. Sperm is missing and the X chromosome is missing. If the mitotic error happens after the, the zygote has begun forming, what we'll see here is something known as mosaicism, whereby the loss of the X chromosome isn't seen in all cells, just some cells. What does this result in? It results in a condition that's not as severe. You can see this in a lot of conditions. Down syndrome is one of the common ones where we see uh, this happening. We will see mosaicism resulting in someone who has features of Down syndrome, but their intelligence can actually be a lot higher than the average person with Down syndrome. Now, there's an important gene associated with Turner syndrome. That is the Shox gene, S-H-O-X. This gene is needed for skeletal development. Now, the Shox gene is located on each sex chromosome, meaning both X and Y. So each female and each male normally would have two functional Shox genes in each cell. In Turner syndrome, we don't have that second X chromosome. So what in turn, they're missing a full copy of the Shox gene in every cell. That's why skeletal development is affected in this condition. Now, the physical findings of Turner syndrome are very unique and, and to be quite frank, they're very easy to identify when you see them or when they're described. So you should not screw this up. Patients are typically short. They have a shield chest. Looks like they're wearing a shield on their chest. Um, they have ovarian dysgenesis. We call this streak ovaries. Can't see that, but they'll often tell you about it. Lymphatic defects that result in a web neck or cystic hygroma and lymphedema in the feet. Uh, shortened fourth metacarpals are common, a high arched palate, and something we can't see unless we have imaging is the horseshoe kidney. That typically won't cause an issue. Uh, it's something we'll see on imaging, uh, incidentally, or uh, during autopsy, but that's not anything to worry about. Now in the heart, we will see a bicuspid aortic valve and coarctation of the aorta. Now keep in mind that in a vignette, they're not gonna be kind enough to say, patient has a coarctation of the aorta. How do we recognize this then? Well. I want you to watch through the description of femoral and brachial pulses, whereby the femoral pulses are going to be weaker than the brachial pulses. They can't really hide that too much. They're gonna to have to straight up tell you the brachial pulses are stronger or the femoral pulses are weaker. Now, the last nugget I wanna share with you here that can really help you confirm Turner syndrome if they tell you, is if they tell you that there are no bar bodies. They might even show you an image of a karyotype when you'll see no bar bodies. Remember, in females, 
they'll turn off one of their X chromosomes because they don't necessarily need both. It becomes a bar body. In this condition, without that second chromosome, there's no bar body. Super easy to identify. Now, before moving on, let's look at a couple other conditions um, that these outlined in your books. There's double Y males and ovotesticular disorder of sex development. So double Y males means a male has inherited two Y chromosomes. So they'll be 47 XYY. Now remember, don't confuse this with Kleinfelder's, which is 47 XXY. This is two Ys, 47 XYY. This patient's gonna be tall, which is the same as Kleinfelter. Uh, severe acne, you can see that in Kleinfelter. Learning difficulties, and typically on the autism spectrum. Now, something really important to differentiate between Kleinfelter and double Y males is in double Y males, fertility is typically normal. In Kleinfelter, it's not. Next up is ovotesticular disorder. We can see this in both males and females. It's actually more common though in females. In this condition, there's both testicular and ovarian tissue present with ambiguous genitalia. Okay, um, not super high yield. I would put most of my energy into uh, Turner syndrome and Kleinfelter syndrome, but you always wanna be aware. All right, how much time do we have left? Let's do one more question. Let's do a matching question, and then we will end this lecture. So go ahead and hit the pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. All right, so here are your correct options. Go ahead and pause if you need to correct anything, but let's take a look, if you're, if you're ready, let's take a look at a few sex hormone disorders. Um, we can determine these based on LH and testosterone levels, basically. So first, we have androgen insensitivity syndrome. This occurs due to a lack of a functional androgen receptor. This is going to affect sexual development where genetic males who are 46XY don't virilize normally. That results in a male who looks female. Very, very interesting. Now, just as a side note here, if you see 46XXDSD, we'd see the presence of ovaries, but virilized or ambiguous external genitalia. That's due to excessive androgen exposure during early gestation. Okay, now going back to androgen insensitivity syndrome, this female appearing patient will have external female genitalia with a blind vagina, which means it basically ends. There's no, um, the vagina does not lead into the cervix and the uterus, just a blind pouch ending. Um, the lack of uterus and fallopian tubes is going to be caused by the constant presence of what we talked about earlier, that anti-malarian hormone from the testes. Now, you wanna look for the following labs in a vignette to help you really diagnose this. Increased testosterone, increased estrogen, and increased LH. Now, if you're asked about what do we do with the testes in this patient, remember, they look female, they sound female, they are probably raised female, so we're going to actually remove the testes because they can increase the risk of cancer. Now, another condition known as hypergonadotropic hypogonadism is going to represent conditions like Turner syndrome, gonadal dysgenesis, or genetic mosaicism. Now, this condition is seen in Kalman syndrome, and it can be caused by CNS lesions. Now, in both of these conditions, the uterus is present, but the breasts are absent. Now, let me quickly, because I talked about Kalman syndrome, let me quickly talk about this. This is caused by a defect or defective migration of neurons and subsequent failure of the olfactory bulbs to develop, olfactory in the nose. This leads overall to a decrease in the synthesis of GnRH in the hypothalamus. Now, aside from the sexual side effects of infertility in males and amenorrhea in females, this is uniquely characterized by anosmia. That's the inability to smell. If you see that in a vignette, you should automatically think common. Maybe you should know the underlying pathophys, which is, of course, as I said, defective migration of neurons and subsequent failure of development of the olfactory bulbs. Now, decreased levels of GnRH, FSH, LH, and testosterone are all going to be seen in this condition. Why? Because GnRH, the one that regulates it all, it's gone. It's missing. All right, next up, we have the 5-alpha reductase deficiency. I touched on this a while ago when we talked about how 5-alpha reductase is going to convert testosterone into DHT and that we could block this with a drug known as finasteride to prevent male pattern balding. Now, in this enzyme deficiency, which is inherited, how? AD, AR, X-linked, any? It's actually autosomal recessive. It only happens in males. And as a result of not being able to convert testosterone to DHT, what happens is that the male is born with ambiguous genitalia, 
They do not masculinize until puberty when that increased testosterone causes growth. All hormone levels like testosterone and estrogen, as well as LH, are going to be normal. Now, the last condition here is placental aromatase deficiency. And placental aromatase deficiency is characterized by the inability to synthesize estrogens from androgens. This results in masculinization of a female infant. So they will have ambiguous genitalia, as well as increased levels of testosterone and androstene dione. Now, during pregnancy, if this happens, you could see virilization of the mother because the androgens can actually cross the placenta, causing virilization. All right, let's end that lecture right here. I'm losing my voice a little bit. I'm going to take a break. Come on back when you want to jump into the next lecture.